Okay, our next talk will be on still sticking with our marine fauna on humpback whales. So Michelle Toms from Iconic Ames. Iconic. <laughs> Iconic marine fauna, charismatic marine fauna. Now, our next talk is Michelle Toms from Ames, who will be um, talking to us about modeling uh, spatial distribution of humpback whales. Thanks very much, Kelly. Okay, see if I can work this. So, as Kelly said, this is the project that I've been leading with the long list of uh, co-authors that you can see there. So firstly, some background about humpback whales. There's about 33,000 humpback whales that migrate annually up the coast uh, from their feeding grounds in Antarctica to give birth and um, breed in the warm tropical waters of the Kimberley. And the same happens on the east coast of Australia. The northerly migration occurs in July and August and is shown uh, on the red arrows on this uh, map here. So, it, whoops, um, top one. So it occurs further offshore um, and the southerly migration occurs in September and October and occurs closer to shore. So they have these uh, aggregation areas uh, that have been found and they occur at Pender Bay here at Camden Sound and at the Foston Tasmanian Shoals area. And I'm uh, not sure if you can see on this map, but there's a dotted line around here, which is supposed to be the carving area. It's meant to be between, uh, or sought to be between the Las Pedes and Camden Sound. And so whaling caused almost po total population collapse of both the East Coast and the West Coast population of humpback whales. And uh, that occurred in the early 1900s, of course. And since then they've recovered. They're now listed as vulnerable and uh, they've been doing so well. Some have actually even suggested that they get delisted. So a lot of the uh, information that I've just described, uh, all of that knowledge, we have to thank Kurt and Michelle and Jenna. Uh, they've been doing surveys on humpback whales for about the last three decades. There's also been extensive area and boat surveys, um, not only done by the Centre for Whale Research, but also industry, government, tourism. And a lot of these surveys have been done uh, for environmental impact assessments for industry. And so the individual data sets have been analysed and reported on, but a lot of it is uh, in the grey literature and so not available to be used often for management. So recognition of all these data sets really offered an opportunity to synthesise these, this data and to quantify the spatial distribution and critical habitats and the important drivers of their distribution, which is pretty much unknown for the West Coast population. So, of course, the Kimberley area, as we've heard many times already, it's remote and it's very large. And so combining all of this data is, is really prudent, this existing data, and, um, and, and synthesising it all together can allow for powerful new insights. And, it's, and it's, this is what we really need to get a holistic approach to better inform management strategies of this population. So our objectives were to amass all the data to develop spatial models of humpback distribution and abundance in the Kimberley, to quantify the important habitats, to understand the drivers of distribution, and a further objective was to advise on future monitoring of humpbacks, especially in the Low and Garam Camden Sound Marine Park. So I don't expect you to read everything in this table, it's really just to show all the data sets that we used here and to show that they were quite extensive. And all told, it, was, uh, it encompassed 13 years and 691 sample days, 18,000 whales were counted across all of those surveys. We used two different types of modelling here. Uh, the first and, and the preferred method was density surface modelling. And with this type of modelling, you combine distance sampled with generalised additive models to predict density. And you predict that uh, density from environmental covariates. And one of the really great things about uh, distance sampling and this method is that it accounts for incomplete detectability. So with distance sampling, we, it's understood that not all animals are detected. And um, this is just, whoops, that's the wrong button again. And this can be shown here on this uh, little schematic. So on the x-axis, we have uh, distance from the observer. So distance that the uh, whale is from the observer, that is. And on the y-axis, the probability of detection. 
So the further the, the whale is from the observer, the less opportunity we have to detect the whale. So by fitting this detection function, then we can allow for the number of animals that we've missed and adjust our estimates accordingly. And uh, the method also accounts for survey effort. And so uh, in order to be able to use this model, we need these really important inputs so that the distances um, have been collected and that we have information on the length of the transects. And so where we don't have these, uh, these inputs, and this uh, is often the case for, for some of the unsystematic sampling that, we've, that we uh, have used here, uh, we've been using a species distribution model approach, and in particular, this one called maximum entropy. So here, the data are modelled as presence absence rather than counts, and then we predict the probability of occurrence or the, the habitat suitability. And so uh, we use both these um, response variables, the counts and the presence absence. We used a range um, of environmental predictors. And we also modelled the groups with calves separately to see if this vulnerable group had different habitat requirements. We also modelled the months separately uh, so that we could uh, show the change in spatial distribution as the season progressed. So here are all the data that we used for each of the models. On the left, these are the data that we had for the density surface model. They're all aerial surveys, and you can see the underlying pattern in the survey path there. We had three years' worth of data. The remaining data sets were used in the presence absence model, and that included both aerial survey data and vessel survey data. Uh, all of these years uh, were incorporated. Uh, so um, I should say each of these points represents a whale a group of whales that were sighted. Uh, thanks to Kelly, I don't really need to explain uh, the aerial or vessel surveys anymore. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and so I'll just jump straight into the results of the density surface model. So we used um, all those environmental predictors that I mentioned and we tested all combinations of those. And we used, also used day of year as, as a predictor uh, so that we could show how the abundance changes over the course of the season. And we also had um, year as a random effect. So the top model uh, was the one that included water depth, day of year, and this um, spatial smooth on latitude and longitude. So it's like an interaction between latitude and longitude. And so um, both AIC and BIC ranked this model as the, as the top model with uh, 67 and 99% support. And so when we look at the predictions now, uh, this is date on the x-axis, um, number of whales on the y, and so we can see that um, the whales increase steadily over the season. They peak around mid-August, they start to decline, and, and then by mid-September decline quite rapidly. With water depth, uh, we had a peak in abundance at around uh, 35 to 40 metres water depth within um, abundance becoming uh, a bit variable in, in the higher water depths. So here on the right, we have the spatial prediction and we can see that the highest density area was at Pender Bay. And it's probably important to say here um, that Pender Bay is a gateway in and out of the Kimberley area with you know, the animals um, moving in and out. And so this could account for the fact that um, there's quite high density at Pender Bay as compared, say, to somewhere like Camden Sound, which is considered the end point um, of the migration and, um, and, and the breeding ground. So when we uh, did the modelling on the different months separately, um, firstly, for, the, for later in the season, for September and October, the same model was predicted to be the top, um, so the one with, uh, with depth and day of the year. And the same spatial prediction showing that Pender Bay was the most important area. Then when we look at um, the peak of the season in August, um, that uh, same model wasn't the top model. This time it was a model with sea surface temperature. So here the abundance of whales increases uh, as water temperature does to about a peak of 24 to 25 degrees and becoming a bit more variable after that. And when we look at the spatial prediction, we see that um, Pender Bay is important, but it's, um, some of these areas are now equally important. So Camden Sound, the Tasmanian Shoal area, uh, James Price Point, and uh, Gordon Bay here. And so this probably reflects the fact that in August, it's the peak of the season, 
the, the, uh, the whales have migrated up the coast and so um, there's sufficient time then for all these areas to be occupied. Whereas in September, October, uh, they've emptied out, if you like, because the southern migration has already begun and so perhaps we're, we're then getting this high density at, at uh, Pender Bay. So not only did we have survey data, we also had some um, satellite tracking data. So satellite tracking devices were, were deployed on humpback whales over three seasons. There are 46 uh, whales that were tracked over these three seasons, both northbound and southbound. And what I've done is just aggregated all those tracks and I've added up the amount of time spent in each of these uh, 10 kilometre grid cells. And what I've plotted here is the number of days in each of these grid cells. So the, so the, the maximum um, period of time was four days. And so these uh, warmer areas are then uh, where more time has been spent. So we're seeing a really similar pattern and that um, similar hotspots to the density model that is. And what we also did was we looked at the underlying uh, metrics under the track. So the speed of the animals, the turning angle, and what we could see from that was that the whales were almost always in this resident sort of mode or milling mode, some people call it, so not migrating. And this makes sense because the animals are coming here to breed. It's a commonly held view that the animals all um, migrate to Camden Sound, um, but you can see from this data that that's not always the case. So now for the results of the presence absence model. And the distance to coast was the most influential predictor of, of habitat suitability. And these bars, the, the pink bars are when we uh, analysed all months combined and the other bars are just for the uh, the, the different months that were analysed separately. So distance to coast, uh, we can see here for all groups combined and then for the groups that had calves. And so we can see uh, for both it declined steadily but more rapidly uh, for females and calves. So here are the spatial predictions of habitat suitability from this model. And what we can see, um, well, sorry, I'll just quickly uh, describe what you're seeing here. This is for all whale groups and for all months and then for June, July, August and September. So we can see that um, the, the areas that are important are, are the coast of the Dampier Peninsula, this uh, Foston Tasmanian Shoals area and Camden Sound. And then when we look at the, um, the different months, we can see this similar pattern that I showed before with the density model that uh, the animals are, are, this is their northerly migration, so they're occupying these more southerly sites. As the uh, migration progresses, they're, they're occupying the more northerly sites. As the northern migration starts, then they're emptying out of Camden Sound and only being found in these more southern sites. So here are the ones, the predictions for, for the groups with calves, and it's pretty much the same story, so I won't go over it again, but the main point is that um, this distance to coast. So um, the animals uh, are much closer to coast uh, than, the, than all wild groups combined. And what we can also see um, is that in June, July, we've got groups with calves down here in the southern part of the Dampier Peninsula. When, as I said before, there's this commonly held view that all of the animals are calving in, in Camden Sound. I should say as well that I've overlaid on uh, these maps, the, um, this large box is the Commonwealth Marine Reserve and this little um, triangular one in here is the um, Lallingarum Camden Sound Marine Park. So you can see that um, it's uh, well covered in terms of covering that uh, hot spot at Camden Sound. So uh, I just thought I'd show uh, this on a binary scale um, of habitat suitability so you can see, really see more clearly this difference in uh, distance to coast. So we've got all wild groups combined and the groups with calves and uh, when we plot these over each other you can see that the, the groups that have females and calves are occupying a much, uh, an area that's much closer to the coast and it has a much smaller spatial extent. So future monitoring, I uh, also said that this was one of our um, objectives of the project and so how to monitor humpbacks into the future. 
we started to think about whether we could do this using very high resolution satellites. Some of you might have heard of World V2 and World V3 got mentioned yesterday, I think. It's operated by Digital Globe. World V2 has 50 centimetres on ground resolution and World V3 has 30 centimetres. And uh, we decided first that we would see if there were any archived images in the World V2 uh, catalogue and we did find one that was suitable. There was one that was taken over James Price Point coincided at a similar time where we had some surveys so we could compare the results. And I'll just show you those results quickly. Um, and we, we managed to get this, um, this image without paying for it, just on an evaluation licence, which was really great because it uh, didn't turn out to be that useful in the end. So the top eight images are all boats. They're quite easy to see. And these um, bottom... Um, 12 images we think are whales or whale related features and they probably don't look very much like whales to you um, but the size um, of them gave the indication that they were maybe this one looks a little bit more like a whale but these are surface features um, humpback whales don't spend a lot of time at the surface and when they do they're partially submerged and when they go under they leave these uh, footprints which might be some of these features that we're seeing here but Anyway, we determined that the resolution of World V2 was probably just not quite up to it. So what we did was we tasked the World V3 satellite. Uh, we took an image over a 425 kilometre square area in the peak of the season, and we did this uh, over the marine park. And so, lo and behold, now you can see whales when you have the right resolution. So this was really exciting. It's really exciting to think that you can count whales from space. Um, and it's particularly exciting uh, for my collaborator, Kurt Jenner, I'm not sure if he's here in the audience, but um, for him, he's done a lot of these uh, aerial surveys and shipboard surveys are extremely time consuming. They take a long time to analyze. So, so it is really exciting. And so for those of you who um, are still awake, you might be able to see that one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> and of course, uh, we this boat here, and you can see that boats are really easily distinguishable because they're entirely on the surface and their edges um, are obviously really clear, unlike whales that are partially submerged. Um, but so, of course, there's always downsides um, to all of these things. The costs of the World V3 satellite are really, really high. And so it's something like $70 per square kilometre. So it's still very expensive, but the costs are coming down all the time. Uh, when we first started looking at World V2, it was really expensive. Then they launched World V3 and the costs had come down. Now they've launched World V4 even. So they're coming down all the time. So I think it's good to still start to address uh, the cost benefits of this type of technology. So uh, it's a lot more, up to 10 times the cost of boat surveys, even up to 50 times the cost of aerial surveys. But there's really a lot of benefits to this type um, of monitoring. I mean, obviously you get this information in an instant uh, and the analysis time is a fraction of that required for traditional surveys. Um, at the moment, of course, because of the costs, it's probably only really, um, we can only really implement it for small areas like um, Camden Sound uh, or Pender Bay. But if we really want to know something about, or if we really want to estimate abundance over the whole region of the Kimberley that humpback whales use, then we're never going to be able to afford that. And so aerial surveys and boat surveys still have a role to play there. So it really depends on the question that we want to address. Um, and I think I've um, just put in the bottom there how many whales we counted in that imagery. So in the World View 2 imagery, we were developing an automated algorithm that uses shape. But here, um, to train that algorithm, uh, Kurt actually counted these images by eye and there were 32 whales. He, he even tells me he saw eight calves. He hasn't sent me a picture of those yet. Uh, and then in the other image, there were 25 whales and, and including six calves. And these, uh, this was comparable uh, to what we saw in the, um, in the traditional surveys. So the key outputs and considerations and implications. So we've quantified the spatial and temporal abundance and habitat suitability of humpback whales in the Kimberley. And, and these distribution maps that we've produced 
are going to be really useful to evaluate the potential effects of current and proposed human activities on humpback whales in the Kimberley. And, and it's because we've been able to produce a map that shows the actual number of animals that could be impacted in a particular area. So they'll be really powerful. We found that the abundance was highest in Pender Bay across the entire season, and with Camden Sound important, but mostly important only in August. Whales in Pender Bay have only limited protections that are provided by the designation of the area as a multiple use zone with the Kimberley CMR. So we really think that um, given the really high abundances that occur here over the entire breeding season, we suggest that it should be given marine park status. So the carving and nursing areas were closer to shore and smaller in spatial extent. And the carving areas extend southwards along the Dampier Peninsula, rather than being confined to the Camden Sound area. And I should highlight here a new paper by Lynn Irvine. She's a PhD student I co-supervise. It comes out this week in Marine Mammal Science. And she shows that significant numbers of humpback whales were born at Ningaloo and suggests that um, a substantial part of the migratory corridor along Western Australia might in fact um, be important for carving, not just these confined and discrete localised areas. So um, whilst I've said this data has been really useful and powerful, um, what you might have noticed is that the data is quite old now. So there hasn't been a systematic survey of the entire Kimberley area that's used by humpback whales since 2007. So it's really now pretty crucial that we have a monitoring program implemented to manage them into the future. Thank you very much.